while traveling on the long drive. Make sure to stop if you see any of the following Patreon members who made this recording possible. Jared Rasher, Matt Burr, Goat Throne Covenant, ILB 760, Business Wolf Studios, Andrew Henks, Tom Bransfield, Mike Schwalen, and Gregory Larson. Thank you for your contribution, and good luck in your travels. Three friends on the open road. They have no destination in mind because right now they are truly lost in a sea of asphalt. With nothing more than a name to hunt down, a face to find in a scattering of old crops and forgotten cars, our trio picks a direction and just drives, trying to ignore the shadows in the peripheral and the haunts that wish to keep them on the long drive. Episode 2, Fueled by Hunger. Brought to you by the Fandible Podcast Network. Hey everybody, this is Billy from the Fandible Podcast Network, and welcome to episode 2 of our Chronicles of Darkness game called The Long Drive. We have Jesus, we have Angela, and of course we have the wonderful David on the mic how are y'all doing today? All right. Doing all right. I'm ready to be terrified. Great. Do you think we're going to insult any other states? I mean, last time it was North and South Dakota or whatever, you know, whatever Dakota it <laughs> yep. is. Well, let me roll the dice. Uh, screw you, Colorado. Colorado oh, it is. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they have it coming. I feel like we've turned backwards from where we were trying to go, but I'll take it. <laughs> I mean, maybe. I, I don't know. Where is North, South, maybe Dakota? Honestly, <laughs> except for in our hearts. In our hearts. The true Dakotas were the friends we made along the way. So we're going to start out just, I'm going to announce a few things that you guys know, and then I'm going to toss the introduction stick towards uh, whoever I decide to take the scene. You guys will take the scene, and we will go from there. So right now, you have been on the long drive for not that long of a time. Less than an hour ago, you were told by a hookman that you were stuck on some place called the other side, the highway, that you weren't dead, but you were no longer in the land of the living. You were in the area between those two places where the things of the highway exist. He told you a few things to remember. He said that the only person that can get you out of here is Clementine. No matter what, even if you found and you were able to persuade another creature of the highway to cross over with you, they can't bring you out of it. The only person that can bring you out is the person who brought you in. And that was Clementine. You also learn that Clementine is somewhere on the highway. You have no idea where, though you did hear her on the radio, screaming for help. Something about Ricky, which might be the person who originally killed Clementine. Hey, Zeus, we're going to start with you. Your character, introduce yourself, of course, introduce your character. But you're the one driving, and what was the car's name again that you were driving? Lucille. Lucille. Tell me where you're driving, or if you're just driving in any direction, and how you are doing mentally. It has been one hour since the last episode. Guys, this is Jesus. I'm playing Hank. Before this started, I was just a regular college student. I uh, played sports, actually is have a football scholarship. That doesn't mean I'm stupid or anything. Just, you know, it's a convenient that I go to school for free because I'm so good. But there I am driving after that situation with a certain hook man, a certain oil man, a certain terrifying place I'm in. And I'm actually driving down this highway just in a direction I have no idea where I'm going, and I have been silent the entire time. I have not sung one word of the fantastic music of Bruno Mars. I didn't even turn on my radio. And my, both my friends know I must be feeling really, really scared if I'm not trying to sing Bruno Mars right now. So Hank is driving, definitely white-knuckling that wheel. Who's the co-pilot? If I recall correctly, that was me by happenstance, because... Charlie, Angela's character, dove into the back seat, and I happened to get into the passenger seat while we were all escaping the oil man. So, hey, everybody, this is Dave. 
and I am reprising my role as Lee, the introverted man. I am giving moral support and looking for turnoffs from the highway that we are currently racing down, but it's a highway in the middle of the sticks. We are buffered on either side by soybean or corn or, you know, who the fuck knows. And Lee is he's a skinny white boy with a shaved head and a patchy beard and a Metallica t-shirt and had aspirations for this trip that had to do with reading a bunch and maybe camping because camping, how hard could that be? And now it's more down to how can we possibly get the hell out of here and find a normal town? Lee, as you are sitting there in silence, looking out the window as you pass corn or soy, or maybe it's just weeds at this point, At first, you think it's the wind rushing through the stalks, but then you just get a feeling that it's not so much the wind, it's something following you almost. It's unseen. It's not like you see any scales or feathers, but it just feels like instead of the wind blowing, something is in that corn just running as fast as it can, almost like it's waiting for you to stop. Or maybe it's in your head. Who knows? I adjust the side view mirror to check to make sure nothing's behind us because it's Lucille and Lucille will show you whatever she damn well pleases. It just shows me what's behind me for a moment and then just creaks and then just shows the cornfield as it races by. When you adjust the mirror, David, Mm -hmm. there's a flash of light, almost like it's electricity of something sparking and you think maybe there's headlights behind you. But when you go back to adjust it, there's nothing. The only thing that you see is... Charlie, which is Angela's character, sitting back there, currently staring at her camera. Angela, introduce yourself and your character. Hey everyone, this is Angela, and I am back playing Charlie, the artist of the group, who has her camera that sometimes shows interesting things, I think is the best way to describe this camera. Because it's a Polaroid, right Billy? Yes, it is a Polaroid. It's one of the newer models, newer as in like it was made before camera phones really got into popularity. So like it's it's vintage itself. It's not one of the retro new ones. It is a vintage, but it's a newer vintage. It's not like something from the 70s, 80s, 90s. It's early 2000s. Okay. But you love it. You love it. It is a good camera. It is a good camera when it's not freaking me the hell out. So Charlie is in the back looking at her camera, occasionally like looking from side to side or even turning around to look out the rear window because she can't shake the feeling that that something's got to still be following them. Like getting away from the horrors of the police station, of the rest stop before it, all those things. It can't be this easy. Something is going to come and drag them back. You're right. You do feel like something's going to drag you back or you feel like no matter how far you drive, you're always going to be stuck in those two places. Jesus, you are driving, again, just in silence. The whole car is just filled with silence because what do you talk about after finding out that you are in a realm that no one has ever thought about? The idea of a highway being between life and death. But the thing that you are keenly aware of, Jesus, is that your gas light is blinking. It just came on to alert you that you are on maybe your last gallon, if not less than that. You are running out of gas and you are in the sticks and you are far, far, far too far away to call AAA. Why are we almost out of gas? We're in the land of the fucking dead. Why does gas fucking matter? We didn't remember to fill it up. No, what was- well, you did. But you stopped off at the gas station about three, four, five hours ago, and you just kind of haven't been focusing on it since. Your car never got great gas mileage, Jesus. This doesn't feel supernatural in nature that your car has been eating through this much gas. It feels like this is the right time that you would normally fill it up, but you've not passed anywhere that has any gas. You haven't passed anything that has any sign of life. Right now, you've just been driving, and it feels like that corn, soy, weed fields that surround you are getting narrower and narrower. I haven't seen any, like, parked cars or anything. It's just been road and wheat. No, you haven't. 
There's not been any cars. There's not been any parked cars. There's not been anybody. Right now, you honestly could be on the same road and just be repeating it over and over. I mean, there's just nothing that really distinguishes one spot from the next. We need gas. And I have no idea if there's a gas station in this this place. And not only do you need gas, but you're also hungry. Uh, you guys... I mean, especially David, he had hoped to grab a hot dog at that rest stop at some point, but that never came to be. And right now, you've just been left in silence, and that silence has allowed you to think of a lot of things. How screwed you are, how scary this is, and just how hungry you are. And, you know, you did pack a cooler full of food, but that's currently in the trunk. Because you moved everything to the trunk when you made room for Clementine. Hmm. Okay, um... How much further do you think we can get on this on on less than a quarter of a tank? Probably an hour or so. An hour that may not actually get us anywhere. Yeah, this is, road has been going on for a long time. I've seen a lot of horror movies where the road just keeps going. I don't know if that's happening right now. Okay, well, we have two ideas. We have two things. We can either keep going and run out of gas, or we can pull over and figure out what we want to do with the last gas that we've got. I suggest that we pull over and we take a look at what we've got and then figure out if we do need to go on foot either now or all, all of a sudden then 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 we know what we've got and we know what we can grab. What's the point in stopping? I We have two options. We go ahead. We go back. We shouldn't go back because there's a crazy hook man. So the only option is to go forward because I don't know about you, but I have seen enough horror movies to know I am not going into the fucking corn. Is everyone else hungry? Yeah, I'm pretty hungry, and also I don't I don't really watch a lot of horror movies, so I'm just going to have to trust you guys on this one. Do not go into the corn. Do not go into the light. Avoid scary children. Outer space is evil. Avoid clowns. Sewer grates. I mean, if they don't have knives on them, I don't understand why clowns are a bad thing. But, okay, how about this? How about this? Because I think we're, it's been a couple of hours. We will stop, but just to grab something to eat from the, from the trunk in the back that we put in there because of fucking Clementine. And I'm going to pull to the side of the road. Let's just eat something quickly. That's right. The, 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 the hook sheriff, and that's, that's a sentence. Hook sheriff. Is that his murder name? Well, he didn't kill anybody as far as we know. He said he, 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 he got himself there so he wouldn't, and then he didn't. He didn't kill us. So, so we're gonna, I'm going to call him the sheriff, which is an honorary title because he had the badge and didn't, didn't murder us with a hook. So... Um, he he said that the only one who could get us out was Clementine, if that makes any sense. Jesus, you pull over as you're having this discussion. Do you shut off the engine? I shut off the engine, saving some gas. I just wanted to make sure you parked as David was bringing up some stuff. The car is now silent, save for that small ticking that a car usually indicates, like, hey, your keys are still in there. But that's the only thing you hear, even with... One of the windows, Charlie, one of your windows is slightly cracked. You you don't hear things like bugs or crickets or just the wind blowing. It's just nothing. It's an airy sort of silence. But go on, David. You were speaking. So um, Clementine was on the road near the cornfield when we last saw her and then we met her and then she left into the cornfield so maybe if we can just meet her again she can be like my bee here you go you're no longer in whatever whatever nightmare this is right the problem is finding her because again not going into the corn no, we've all seen Children of the Corn. We're not going to the corn. I have no idea what that is. Well, no, apparently he hasn't because he's oh, like right. yeah, yeah. fucking pretentious. I want you guys to roll intelligence. This is a memory thing. I'm going to give you guys some advice if you're interested in what you could do to find Clementine. Just straight intelligence? Just straight intelligence. I just want to see if you're able to remember it. I have one success. I got nothing. Uh, Nope, negative. As you're talking about where you guys could go, you don't know. I mean, honestly... As the guy said, this highway stretches across everywhere. This is a massive amount of land to find one person. This is truly a needle in the haystack situation. So with that in mind, as you are trying to to figure out 
where you could possibly go, where you could start your hunt. Angela remembers one pertinent thing. You do know where Clementine lived. She gave you the name of the town. Does anybody remember the town's name? Bakersville sounds familiar. Bakersville. Baker's what? Bakersville. It's where Clementine said she was from. Yeah, is it, are you saying she might be? I'm saying that we have no other ideas. I, unless you unless you have something. I mean, if no, you have I, something, I, please uh, share it now. This is sharing time. No, my mind is just full of terror, so that's something. Anyone else? Because I we're, that sounds like a good idea to me. No, I I, I hey, you know, I just want to I just want to grab my power bar from the back and then figure stuff out. Okay, so the idea I would say is to go to Bakersville, or at least that's the destination. There's two things. First off, definitely need to go out and get the food out of the trunk. Uh, secondly, you don't really know where you've been driving. Again, it's been just a steady drive as you guys try to absorb what's been going on. So you need to figure out where you are at. Luckily for you, David, you do have those map index cards. Yes, I do. You look up in the sky and there are stars. They look a little dimmer than what you remember. And it might be maybe in South North Dakota or a Dakota. That's just how they look. Or maybe it's because you're somewhere else. But with those aspects, you might be able to figure out where you currently are located or at least get an estimate of which direction you need to drive. Yeah. Okay. With that in mind, who's getting food? Who's studying the map? What are you all doing? Starting with Hank. I am going into the back and I am grabbing a sandwich I made. So you're going in the back. Angela. Uh, I'm going to go to the trunk as well and grab some food. Okay. And David, what are you doing? I'm going to also go to the trunk and grab food and batteries because I established I had a flashlight last time. He's anticipating they're going to run out of gas and we're going to have to hoof it. So yeah, making a small like afternoon pack. Great. So this is what happens. You all meet up in the back and you open up the trunk and the first thing you notice when you open it up is there is a stench. No. Oh. It's a bad stench. I mean, this is not just like rotted eggs bad. David, you actually remember uh, at one time you were asked to help clean out your grandmother's apartment after she died. Mm-hmm. And there was some miscommunications and her electricity got turned off a week before you even were able to get there. So you had to clean out the refrigerator. Oh, no. So that is what kind of hits the back of your mind. Oh, Nana was on a keto diet, too. That's. Does anybody want to open the cooler? Nope. <laughs> yep. No, I'm doing it. I'm really grossed out. I take out a handkerchief and then like I walk away. I'm like, oh, that's so gross. And then I stop and I look right at the, the cooler like it just said something about me. <laughs> and then it's going storm up and whip it open. You rip this thing open and a cloud of insects. Ew, ah! ew. A swarm of insects fly out and David, you're going to need to make a dexterity plus dodge to avoid swallowing some of these things. Since you are right there in front of it, this is going to be at a negative one. I am not going to give you any more negatives because of the smell because you have that concentration merit. Mm -hmm. Angela and Jesus though, you're not so close to it, so it's just make a dexterity plus dodge roll for yourself if you want to avoid these as well. Uh, okay. Obviously. Yeah, yeah, that's going to happen. So go ahead and roll, everybody. One success. Oh, four successes. I need three successes. You guys are able to stumble away. Hank and Charlie are further away, so it is easy for you guys to just kind of run down the road with your hands up saying, nope, 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 nope. David, you do scream. But then there's that like lizard part of your brain that says, close your damn mouth now. And you do as you get a face full of bugs and you can feel them trying to get into your mouth, into your nose. But you're just slapping yourself, silly. You're just banging on your face like it's a bongo until you finally feel like the remaining bugs on your face are dead. And that the other bugs have decided to fly off into the wonderful nature of South Dakota or North Dakota. Or Dakota. Yeah. Oh, but it does break up that silence for a, a, about a half a minute as you hear the buzzing get further and further and further away. 
But yeah, it was like they were trying to enter your... What kind of creature tries to be eaten? It doesn't make sense. But it looks like right now the swarm has left the car. And you just see the darkened outline of the open cooler. Even from this far away, as far as you ran, Dave, you could still kind of smell something's coming from there. <coughs> um, somebody, um, I think something's wrong with the sandwiches. No shit. I knew that without opening that thing. I carefully go forward and look inside the cooler. What did you pack for food? I mean, I'm going to give you some staples of things that are still fine. You packed crackers. Those looked like they're still in their package. You packed some peanut butter. You ate half the peanut butter on your drive here, but the other peanut butter looks a little crusty, but still fine, though it's caked in a variety of decomposition from the other food. You have some gummy treats as well. Oh, and you also have a 12-pack of water, one of those bottled waters. Those are the things that, that are fine. I want you each to tell me one thing that is certainly not fine, and that's because it was a perishable. I definitely brought Lunchables, like a goddamn 12-year-old that I am, because we're going camping, and we've established that Lee is ill-equipped to camp, and that's what he brought. Those Lunchables, I mean, they're so disgustingly covered in mold and filth that you don't even think for a second to try to save the candy bar that comes with each Lunchable. I mean, it, it's just, it's not worth it. Even if you, like, cleaned it and unwrapped it and disinfected it, you would still probably taste a little bit of that funk. I mean, it's a Three Musketeers, so, yeah. Charlie. Charlie had brought some fresh fruit. Like, she brought oranges and apples and bananas, and those are the first to go, I'm sure. Half of them have already collapsed in on themselves. It's disgusting. Hey, Zeus. As we were driving back, I, of course, stopped by at one of the most famous sandwich shops in South or North Dakota called Big Joe's. And I, there they made custom 12-inch long but very high uh, sandwiches. I picked the all-meat special where they put all the meat, several types of cheese, and I was just planning to eat it in parts as along the trip. Even though it's been pristinely wrapped, you haven't touched this thing. You were dreaming about this thing no longer than like three hours ago. It's shrunken and shriveled and just is gross. There's no saving those. Honestly, there's no really saving the cooler, or you, you shouldn't really want to save the cooler, but you, like I said, you guys do get half a jar of peanut butter, a sleeve of crackers, and six fruit snacks. That's what you have left on the long drive. I say this is weird, but compared to everything else so far, I take out the stuff and I dump the cooler out of the car. All right, so what are you guys doing now that you've taken stock of the situation are you eating some food are you walking around the outskirts are you taking a pee near the cornfield you know basic don't do this in a horror movie stuff i have seen a horror movie so i'm not going near the car field i'm turning my back towards my friends and i am peeing on the road on the road i am not going into the cornfield i'm not going near a cornfield great it's embarrassing but oil man charlie Charlie is not touching a goddamn thing that was in that cooler or anywhere near it. She will take some of the bottled water because that was not gross. But otherwise, yeah, she'll take the water and she'll go try to study this map. Great. Lee, what are you doing? Well, if no one's going to run against him, Lee is going to become the mayor of Flavortown. And he's going to eat a bit of everything because he's hungry as hell. And then he's going to kind of wander off towards the cornfield and say, I'll be right back. Where are you going? To pee. Hey, hey, hey. I, I'm trying to stop, but I'm still mid-flow. God damn it, man. I'm glad that you're comfortable with that, but I got to pee somewhere where, like, David and Jesus, I need you to make a perception check. Perception plus alertness. You're going to do a negative two, both of you. It's dark. You guys are arguing. Angela, you have a negative one if you're interested in this perception check as well. Sure. All right. Let's see what happens. Nope. Oh, I got a zero. Nine, nine, eight. Four successes. Look at you with your eyes, all of both of you. Congratulations. Hank, you are focusing on a uh, delicate situation here. You're trying to stop yourself from peeing, which is hard to do. <laughs> let's be honest with you. Yeah. And you're trying to save your friend from going into the most... They should practically just name this field, this cornfield murder field, because that's exactly what it looks like. People go into this field to die. And uh, Lee has no filter for that sort of even understanding of this is a bad idea. 
Yeah, he's seen years of hee-haw. People just tell jokes in there. It's fine. Angela, you kind of step towards Lee to stop him, but then you catch something moving through the field, and you turn your eyes towards it, and you realize that you've found a gap between the crops. It's like an alleyway through these stalks. You wouldn't have even noticed it if you weren't standing right where you're standing, and you could see into the cornfield. Lee, you see Charlie, her face just kind of falling a little bit as she's looking into the cornfield, and you follow where she's looking, and you too can see into the cornfield. About 100 feet into that cornfield, it seems to stop with the corn or the soil or whatever tall weeds, and it's just a flattened area, maybe even the start of a crop circle. And in that crop circle, standing in the moonlight, are people. Naked people. But no, it's not just naked people. Genderless people. There's no breasts. They have the shaping of an butt, but there's no orifice. There's nothing. It's almost like they are made out of just white wax or a simile of what a person should look like. There's four of them. And they're just scattered around this little opening. All crouched down and they're digging. Oh, they're moving. Yes, they are moving. And not like jumping around. Their arms are just moving frantically as if they're kind of like a dog trying to unearth a bone. And that's all they're doing. They haven't noticed you, even with the arguing. They just seem to be focused on digging. Hank doesn't see this, by the way. He's like, Lee, don't go anywhere. Adam, he's getting louder. Sh- Lee, I sh- swear to fucking. You guys are staring at this very odd sight. Hank, on the other hand, has decided to raise his voice and say, what's going on? Why are you guys staring? Just being loud, like Hank is usually. So as soon as Hank raises his voice, they immediately turn and focus on the three of you. Hank, you definitely see them now. Oh. And they look almost like they're about to pounce and start running after you charging down that small corridor but that energy that they're building that flexing of their muscles is not to chase you or pounce you it's to escape themselves they launch themselves onto the ground and they start digging faster and one even pauses to look at you and that just seems to make him more terrified within 10 15 seconds they've all buried their heads into the ground and their bodies go limp. Make a courage roll. Uh, one success. Two successes. Zero successes. Lee, you you don't have to pee anymore. <laughs> That's not to say you pissed yourself. That's just you've decided on an intellectual level that you could hold it. Yeah, the hierarchy of needs has got flipped around significantly. Yeah, exactly. You didn't botch, so you didn't immediately wet yourself but you're done you're so scared that you don't seem scared you just simply turn around walk to the car open up the side door get inside sit down snap in your seat belt and then just lock the door you're just ready to go you're ready to go you're done you're done yep hank and charlie you're terrified but you don't feel that direct need you can just kind of stand there and watch them and that's all you seem to have to do they're not charging there's nothing else coming at you it's just these lumps of people burying their head in the sand or in the ground and just remaining there still now that you know that these little small corridors exist in the corn as you look down each one you see people digging you're not people these lump people Some of them are burying their head in the ground, and some of them are just trying to dig further. Charlie? What? What are we looking at? Why are you asking me? I'm asking to ask someone because I can't ask myself that question. We are looking at things that we shouldn't be looking at because we should still be driving. There's a shaking of the cornstalk near you. Ah. And one of these lump people walk out of the stalks. They look towards you, and again, it is just a lump of a person. There's no eyes, there's no mouth, but it is looking at you. But then it immediately looks down towards the soil, falls down, and starts digging. And after one or two scoops, 
you see something in that hole that they've dug. You can't get a glimpse of it, but you do see it's almost like the light of a screen is in that hole. And this thing is just digging. It's trying to kind of get rid of the dirt that's covering whatever it is. If anybody wants to get closer to see what it is, you can. But again, that would be a stealth check because, you know, these things are very jumpy. Hank turns around and starts walking towards the car. Hank has done something smart. You know what? I'm pretty stealthy. So despite my better instincts, I'm gonna give this a try. What's your vice? We didn't give me a vice. Want to do curiosity? I can go with that. You can get one willpower back from the last session. As you fulfill this vice. Woot. Question, do I see her doing this? You're walking away. You'll see her in a little bit. But right now, Angela, roll me a stealth check. No difficulty. Try to get close to this thing. Three successes. You absolutely stealth towards this thing. You take one step and it just keeps its back to you. Two step. You are right behind it. And by the third step, as it pulls its head back, and you kind of know that this is going to be the telltale sign of it's about to sink its head in that hole and bury itself, you get a glimpse of what it's unearthing. It's a cell phone with a text message. You don't get the chance to read it, but you do see the stereotypical green-blue bubbles, and this thing presses its head against the screen and then just buries its head. So it is like a modern smartphone. It's not like some 90s Nokia brick. This looks like a somewhat modern, might be an iPhone second generation. Um, So not modern, but an iPhone. And there it is. It just seems content with keeping its face glued to the screen. Its head buried in the sand. Okay, so like it put its face, like that's what it was going for. It's not just coincidentally there's a phone in all these holes. It was it wants to be like. It seems so. Yeah, like I said. Hank, as you open the door to your car to get in, you turn, you see that Charlie is right standing above this thing, looking down. What are you doing? Charlie turns back around and just like holds her finger up to her mouth like, shh. And then carefully backing away. You don't need to make another stealth check. Are you getting to the car? Yes. You get into the car. Dave, this is the fifth time you've asked. And finally, someone's there to maybe respond to you of, can we start driving? (laughs) (laughs) I never wanted to stop. Just putting that out there. So you guys all get into the car. We get into the car. I turn it on. I start driving in the agreed upon direction of a Bakersfield. Well, there's no agreed upon section. Oh, you have no idea. I just drive. Stay silent for like two minutes. And then I look at the rear view mirror at Charlie and say, What were you fucking thinking? I just want to point out, I never wanted to go near that. You two guys. Yeah, especially you, Lee. Need to be like, oh, I'm so dainty and needy and I need to go find a private place to pee. Wait, wait, wait. And you decided to compound that by going near the weird lump creature? Lee rolls down his window and throws out a now full bottle of Gatorade. (laughs) 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 And Lee just calmly rolls up the window and says, I'm fine. There was something in there. I wanted to take a look, and I was fine because I am not a galumphing oaf like the two of you. Uh, there, it was, there were cell phones in the bottom of the, or at least that hole. Wait, wait, wait. Cell phone? Like actual cell phone? Yeah, that like was lit up like it had just received a text, and the thing what? just like planted its face like it wanted to be like one with the phone. What? Yeah, just drive. I, just drive. Don't think about it. I'm just... Yeah, 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 it's probably for the best. Where are we driving? I'm going to try to figure that out. I'm going to take out my map and uh, take a look and try to figure out where to go. Okay, David, since you can't really spread out this map because you are in a very confined area, this is a minus one, but you have the flashlight. You are in a safe space so that it's only a minus one. I got it. So this is going to be survival plus perception. Okay. And does anybody want to try to help him with any way, give him more dice? Anybody have any suggestions? I'm willing to hear it. I'm just focused on driving. Yeah, not turning on Bruno Mars is probably the best thing you can do for this role. (laughs) (laughs) I got a eight and a nine. Great. David, it takes you 10 minutes. It's like using a phone book. It should be easy, but we're a little bit beyond that now. (laughs) Exactly. You are about to say, I can't do this, but then you're out of the cornfield. And you see a ramp coming up and it gives you a number and you know you have to take I-68 east. 
I mean, it's right there. It's not like you have to swerve to find it, but you spot the sign when it says like you are a mile away from the exit, the on ramp. Okay. Okay. Great. We, we're we're actually coming up on something that should be on should be on the right. It's a it's an on ramp. It'll get us out of here, or at least to Bakersfield. It's probably going to be two hours, two maybe three hours. You don't have enough gas to get there, but that would bring you in the right direction. And Jesus, within 30, 40 seconds, you see the on ramp. And again, this entire highway is empty. It's a void of life. There's no cars. There's no corn on the side anymore. But now that you're driving and there's nothing but fields around you, flat surfaces, not even grass, but just kind of like dirt and weed, you are surrounded by white glumps of people, some digging, some already having their heads buried in the ground. It's a disturbing sight, but none of them are on the road. All of them are just standing on the grounds around the highway. Why? Oh, uh. On ramp? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should be coming up on the right. I'm, I'm riding right now. Just, I'm on the right. I'm on the right. I'm on ramping out away from this highway. Yep. And you do. You climb higher onto the ramp, heading towards the east, and you are driving. And you drive. And you finally get to the point where, since you're so high up, you don't really see any more land. And that is actually very preferable because you no longer see people. And by the time you start descending, there's no longer that mile or two of just those glumpy people. It is completely void of life itself or unlife. It is just silence. The only thing you hear is the deafening noise of nothing, that kind of whistle that is growing louder and louder. It's very annoying, honestly. The idea that it could be this silent. I just turn on the radio, homie. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, I think that Hank and Lee share a look as he like reaches towards the knob, and Lee just kind of nods, like an, an ascension, like yeah, turn on the radio, like that moment in Ghostbusters where they both turn on the radio after talking about the apocalypse. Exactly, that is exactly what it is. You don't realize that there was like a vote for turning on the radio, but there was a vote. And everybody was very pro-radio. Mm -hmm. You turn it on, and there's static. You switch it over, there's more static. Static, static, static. And then you pick up one of those AM channels. And it sounds like a talk radio, but it's in Spanish. And it keeps on coming in and out. And the first thing you hear is a man yelling in Spanish. And then the woman replies. And then another guy says. Does anybody here speak Spanish? You need one dot in linguistic and specialize in Spanish. Yes, actually, Lee does. Lee took four years of Spanish in high school and remembers one semester of it. Great. You were able to decipher kind of the gist of what they were saying. It was very overdramatic and weirdly spoken. It definitely feels telenovela-ish, but you got one or two sentences before it craps out. Mm -hmm. And the man says in a very dramatic Spanish voice, it's about the lyrics. The woman says, Michelle Pfeiffer is not a lyric. And then another guy, a, a much weaker guy, a very nasally voice says, best Catwoman though, fight me. Lee's kind of listening. He's, his eyes are canted to the side. So he's kind of focusing on what he's hearing, listen what he's seen. And he smiles halfway through. He points at the radio and says, oh, yeah, Michelle Pfeiffer, we were talking about her. And then his face goes slack. What about Michelle Pfeiffer? Um, Lee? The, 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 the people on the radio said that <clears throat> the song they were listening to was about lyrics. And then some girl, some woman said, Michelle Pfeiffer is not a lyric. And, and then a third guy said that she's the best cat woman ever. Well, I mean, that's not like a unique observation. Yeah, it's not so unique because that was the exact conversation you were having before you almost ran into Clementine. I mean, almost the exact. I mean, probably had to be changed a little bit because it's not a natural way of speaking Spanish. They don't say it that way, but it's close. Yeah, that's the... the 
Because I, I, I said that she's the best Catwoman, fight me. And and then we were all like pointing a lot. And Hank was... Um, and then Hank hit the brakes and like swerved. Speaking of hinting the brakes, Jesus, you don't have to make a drive check. As you crest the hill, you slam on the brakes as you are stopped by at least 12, 13 cars. It's a pileup. It looks like a, an old crash. And the very front of this crash tipped over on its side. It's a semi-truck. T-boning across most of this part of the highway. But you finally found some sign of cars. If you guys want to make a either academics plus intelligence or craft plus perception, I can give you more information. Yes, I would like to do that. Just tell me which one you're doing it. Because one is just the academics of cars and the other one is, you know, you've worked on cars before. I'm doing crafts plus wit. Sorry, perception. Now, if we don't have the skill of crafts, could we still make the roll with like a minus one? Yeah, it's a minus one. Because that's still better for me than uh, intelligence plus academics. I got three successes. Uh, But I failed. One success. David, you're the first to notice this. Angela, once David points this out, you're the one that builds on it. David, you just happen to point towards one of the car and you just say, wow, that's a 1970s uh, taxi. And you know this, David, because uh, as a kid, you were sickly. Surprising, I know. What about my character? Yeah. And for a short time, you'd like to build model cars. Just something that you picked up. You, you had a lot of hobbies. This was before your mom finally got you a Game Boy. And then, and then you focused on the Game Boy. <laughs> but that was a 1967 a Taxi. Oh, like the, uh, the TV show, Taxi. Yeah, that's why I know it. Yeah. Yeah, you're just kind of surprised. Like, oh, wow, that's a, that is a weird find in this place. But you point that out. Angela, once he says, oh, wow, that's a weird car, you realize all of these cars that you're looking at are almost from a different era. And, and that's not uncommon to see like a car from the 80s driving along a bunch of cars from 2000s or whatever. But this seems like an even distribution of cars from the 50s, cars from the 60s, cars from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Usually that's not how it is. You would find like one or two or three rare cars around cars that are about 10 years apart. Is there like a vintage car show happening? If it is, then it's the shittiest vintage cars because some of these cars, they're vintage, but they're also shit. There's a difference between vintage and fucking old. Yeah, I mean, there's a Pinto. Drive slowly. Exactly. It's just like some of these cars, they're old, but no one's collecting them. Most likely, a lot of the dealerships buried these in Mexico and hoped no one found them. I mean, there's a couple of really good finds, but this this doesn't feel like there was an impromptu car show here. Stop the car. Stop the car. I've already stopped. We're in front of a bunch of stopped cars. No, we're in front of a bunch of things that can give us gas. Oh. You ever siphoned gas, y'all? Uh, I cannot legally say <laughs> I did. And I get out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tell me, do you have a gas can? And do you have something that you could use to siphon off? Well... I already got rid of the bottle of Gatorade, so we're down one of those. <laughs> can I use my resources to say that I have something of that sort? To have a gas can, an empty gas can, that would be two resources. If we have a full gas can, we don't actually have a problem. <laughs> you can have one of those cheap, carries like a gallon of gas, plastic gas cans. And uh, you know what? I'll even throw in that you have uh, an old science experiment that you meant to turn in, but you slept through it. So you just kind of left it in your car and got the sea that dealt with like water pressure. And there's a little hose that you used. So you can use that. So yeah, you have a gas can. Do I mark off resources from my sheet? Yes. Just mark off two resources. They'll come back eventually. Okay. Now you guys are climbing out of your car. What are you guys doing? Where are you going? I mean, right now, this is the only place that you've spotted that had any sign of resource. So right now, hopefully you can get gas, but there's also another chance for you guys to investigate to find other things. Hank is going to focus on getting gas and try to stay clear away from the Pinto as much as possible. (laughs) This is a craft check, but you know what? I'm going to say it's a stamina plus gas just to make sure you don't swallow anything. (laughs) Okay. So Hank has decided he's going to be heading towards this collection of cars. What is Charlie and Lee doing? 
Well, Lee is going to hop out of the car, take his flashlight, and he's going to grab a side bag from the back, which is now alleviated of a lot of different snacks. And he's going to shine the light in on Charlie and say, like, I'm I'm going to look around to see if I can't find anything. Um, like food or like, I don't know. What, what would your movies say to do? So my movies would say somebody would go do that. Okay, it's I'll probably... go do that. And he walks off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stay over the car. Make sure no weird things get into it. Okay, so we have three different things. So we're going to focus on the one that is going to be the easiest. Angela, you're sitting in the car. What do you want to do while you're in the car? You're just kind of looking around. And like I said, the outside is just some kind of brown grass. There's no fields. There's nothing crazy like that. There's no corn, there's no oats, it's just kind of an open field, and there's no people in it, and there's these cars. But is there anything specifically you want to do in your vehicle right now? So Charlie is going to, like, perch on the hood of the car, like, very keen from Supernatural, like, just trying to look really cool, even though she does not feel cool. And she's kind of, you know, like, leaning against it, arms crossed defensively across her chest, scanning to make sure nothing pops up out of that field. You know, Angela, this is a, it's weird and it's scary, but it's also very kind of artistic. There's a lot of different cars out in front of you. I'll take a picture. Okay. So you're going to need two successes on this. So basically this is, I can take the photo, of course. This is to see how I'm interpreting it. No, this is basically to see if you capture anything, just accidentally. Like you're going to take the photo no matter what, but this is to basically say, once you've taken it, you look at it, you're going to realize that there's something there. Yeah, I've got it. Um, so it's perception plus alertness. Awareness is not a skill anymore. Yes, let's do that. Let's see. That's three successes. Great. You take a picture. The sound of your flash kind of echoes through the silent void, which is this place. And as the photo pops out, you pick it up and you look at it. Even though you've taken a picture of the cars and there's no way to mess this up, it's a picture of your own face. You can now roll your occult. Intelligence plus occult. One success. You're looking at something that's not there. Wait, so I'm looking at my face. It's your face, but there's no life behind it. Hank, you're walking through these cars, not too far away from Lucio. You're only about two, three cars deep. And as you get closer, somewhere you hear a growl that kind of reverberates through the night. It doesn't sound like it's close, and it honestly doesn't sound like it's a threatening growl. It's almost like something large is sleeping. I'm still looking for a car, but I'm being very quiet about it. Let's do a stealth check. Stealth check plus dexterity, minus two, because you're kind of squeezing yourself through all these things, and you don't know what you're stealthing against. Mm, That's fair. Uh, Two successes. Okay, well, you absolutely make it to the first car, and you kneel down... And now roll stamina plus crafts. No difficulty. You have all the items with you, so that actually gives you a plus one. I'm going to give you a plus one. Plus one. Thank you. So one success. You don't get much gas, but you do get a couple of mouthfuls. (coughs) The thing is, you know what old gas smells like, the gas that you can't reuse. This smells still usable. Mm. So you're going to go to the next car. And I'm not going to continue making you roll. It's just that's kind of how I was going to gauge it to see how quickly you could fill up. You're going from car to car. And each time it's only just a few drops here, a mouthful here, maybe at best a quarter of a gallon here. But it's going to take you some time. David, I want you to make me a perception plus investigation as you're going through this. You do not hear a growl. Honestly, you hear only the occasional cough from Hank as he's sucking these tanks dry. So that's a perception, you said? Perception plus investigation. You're looking for stuff. That is one, one success. You find like a granola bar here. You find a cool lighter at some point and you take that as well. You find a bottle opener. You're not finding a lot of stuff, but what you are doing is going deeper and deeper into this field of cars. And someone who's more genre savvy would probably think, "Mm, no, this is probably not a smart idea. But uh, David, you are known for being kind of hyper-focused. You focus on something and that's all you're worried about. So right now you are focused on finding items that could save you. Mm -hmm. 
so focused that you almost miss out on the voice calling for help. And you stop finally and you turn and Hank is way far away. But the voice, it's closer and it's staticky. And you realize that you are near that tipped over semi truck. And there's a voice on the radio coming from inside the cab. It's muffled, but you can hear someone talking. Oh, yeah, go for that. Well, I mean, I take my vintage Mickey Mouse bottle opener first, and then I go for the cab. You're going to need to make an athletics check. This is not to see if you can make it up to this thing. It's just to see if you don't hurt yourself in the process. You have plenty of footholds, so there's no minuses. But you're climbing up the undercarriage and trying to get onto the top. Okay. You can use willpower if you want, uh, but you have to do it before. One success. You don't hurt yourself. You don't cut yourself. You know, honestly, one success. This is the best athletics prowess you could usually expect from yourself, David. Yes, 100%. You climb up, gasping, kind of rolling onto the trailer. But in your head, you're just thinking, dun da da dun da da dun da da dun Yep. Yeah, total Rocky scene. Throw me the idol. I'll throw you the whip. <laughs> you grab the door and you pull it open. And then you climb down into this cab. And on the radio... You hear a voice. Hello? Hello? God, God damn it, is this thing even working? Hello? It's Charlie. I take out my phone and record the rest. And I pick up the CB walkie. H- hello? Hello? Oh my, oh my god, can, you can hear me? Lee? Oh my god, is that Lee? Are you, are, are you there? Charlie, this is me. It's me, Lee. I'm on a CB radio. Where are you? Why are you on the CB radio? Wait, why? Uh... No, we didn't. You were in the car with us. Lee, listen to me. Whoever is in the car with you is not me. You have just listened to Episode 2, Part 1 of The Long Drive. This is Billy, your storyteller, and I want to thank you for tuning into the Fandible Podcast Network. If you want to follow more of Fandible, go to our Twitter or Facebook. You can find us on Twitter at Fandible and Facebook at Fandible Podcast Network. If you'd like to help us create more of these episodes, feel free to donate at our Patreon. You get monthly games and supplements from us, fan games, and early access to episodes. Thank you again for listening, and be careful on the long drive.